Good evening, everybody. We are on uh, UECM online classes. Uh, the end time closer every day, a study on eschatology. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, let me introduce to you our speaker again. Uh, Dr. David Dean is a professor of Bible and Systematic Theology at BSOP from 1995 to 2008. And I'm privileged to be one of his students. Uh, he's an occasional pulpit and conference speaker in, in the Filipino Chinese churches while he was here in the Philippines. Uh, before we give the floor to Dr. Dean, uh, we would like to ask Reverend Hart Ang uh, to start us with a word of prayer. Reverend Hart is a senior pastor of Makati Gospel Church. All right, let us pray. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful and so excited that tonight we get to gather once again to study your word. And Lord, it is so exciting to talk about what is to come. And yet, Lord, when we talk about things to come, that what might happen, help us, Lord, not to forget what will happen. And that is that you will come back, that any time our Lord will be here. So we need to be ready. So tonight, Lord, as uh, Dr. David Dean, help us to unpack your word and to understand your will. We pray that you will grant him strength and power from above. Guide him so that he may guide us. Grant us wisdom to understand your word. Open our minds to accept your truth. Change our hearts to feel your love. And transform our lives to experience your power. We commit our time tonight unto you. Thank you, Lord, for always speaking to us. Help us to hear you clearly. All this we pray in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, my friends, to this second session of our course, The End Times Closer Every Day. Today, we're going to be looking at views of the kingdom, some interpretive principles with regard to prophecy, and not just prophecy, but the Bible as a whole. And then we're going to spend some time briefly in Daniel chapter 2, but mostly in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 9. Here's a list of our topics. Once again, views of the kingdom in the three millennial views, principles for interpreting prophecy. We're going to talk a little bit about the effects of presuppositions, and you'll see why in a few moments. And then we'll be looking at those chapters in the book of Daniel. Let's begin by reviewing the three basic views on eschatology to which I introduced you last week. They are the amillennial view, the postmillennial view, and the premillennial view. And as we saw last week, the amillennial view and the postmillennial view are extremely similar. They have exactly the same sequence of events. They are similarly simple in the sense that we are living in the church age according to both of these views. And the next great event that's going to take place will basically be the place where history ends and where eternity begins. That event will start with the rapture. Christ will return to the earth at essentially the same time. The great white throne judgment will take place. And then God will replace this present universe, which is tainted by sin, with a new universe, a new heavens and earth, as it's called in the Bible, in which uh, all believers will live as resurrected saints in this new heavens and new earth, enjoying fellowship with each other and with God. Now, we saw also that the premillennial view is much more complicated in that it separates the rapture, the second coming, and the great white throne judgment. The premillennial view holds that there is going to be a seven-year period of time, which we typically call the tribulation period. Now, technically, only the second half of that was labeled by Jesus as the great tribulation. We will see that when we study Matthew 24. Most premillennialists believe that the rapture will take place before the tribulation. All premillennialists agree that the tribulation will end with the second coming of Christ and that it will be followed by a 1,000 year period during which Christ will reign on this earth and his subjects will include both survivors who made it through the tribulation and their descendants as well as resurrected saints from the Old Testament and resurrected saints from the church age. We'll talk a little bit more about the details of the millennium later in the course. The millennium will end with the great white throne judgment and then we move into the new heavens and new earth. 
Now, last time we talked about seven steps in God's plan to glorify himself, and we saw there that regardless of which view of eschatology you hold, we all agree with where we started, where the human race started, and where we are headed. And as we go through this course, I just want to encourage you and also myself that while there are disagreements regarding some of the details of eschatology, we all agree regarding where the Bible says we're headed. And the most important thing is that believers are headed for resurrection life in a new heavens and new earth in fellowship with God. And unbelievers, sadly but truly, will go to the lake of fire. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about the concept of the kingdom and eschatology. And what I'm going to do here is take you through a sequence of things that are revealed in the Bible regarding the kingdom. And I'm going to basically do this in chronological order. Now in 1405, actually that should say 1406, but it's a tiny typo. In 1406 BC, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 17, just before the Israelites crossed the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, God predicted that one day Israel would have a king. At the same time, in the same book, essentially, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God predicted that while Israel would go into the land, that they would possess the land, that they would live in the land for a long time, a time would come when because of their sin, God would cause them to be expelled from the land, they would be taken captivity to a foreign country. And obviously, when that happened, the kingdom would end. So the book of Deuteronomy predicts both the establishment of the kingdom of Israel and its ending. Now we know that it ended in 586 BC. The predicted kingdom began in 1051 BC when Saul came to the throne. The kingdom split when Solomon died in 931 BC. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians, and in 586 BC, the southern kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians. That's when the kingdom of Israel ceased to exist, and it hasn't existed in the world ever since then. However, before the kingdom ceased to exist during the reign of King David, God gave David a promise that we call the Davidic covenant. Now you may want to look that up later. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In that covenant, God promised that a day would come when a descendant of King David would begin to reign on the throne of David over the people of Israel in the land of Israel. And once that day came, the kingdom would never end. Now that promise has to fit in with all the other information that was given, which means that the kingdom that existed in the time of David would end and then later it would be reestablished. Now when we come to the time of the Gospels, we have John the Baptist and then Jesus both speaking of a kingdom. You remember that they both proclaim this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is where we begin to run into disagreements regarding the nature of the kingdom that John the Baptist and Jesus were speaking of. Now, just before Jesus died, Jesus, in a conversation with Pilate, uh, was answering Pilate's question. He says, are you a king? And Jesus' answer was, yes, but now my kingdom is not from here. Well, Jesus then went to the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And during the 40 days that he spent on earth before he ascended to heaven, he taught the disciples and opened their minds to understand the things that were spoken about him in the Old Testament. And just before he left, the disciples asked him a question. They said, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, Jesus didn't say to them, that's a bad question. He didn't say, you misunderstood the plan. He simply said, I have other work for you to do, and I can't answer that question for you right now. Now, the last thing I want to point out at this point is that Revelation chapters 19 and 20 appear to indicate that the kingdom will be reestablished after the second coming. You see, Revelation 19 ends with the second coming, and Revelation 20 begins with the prediction of the millennial kingdom. So, if we accept the idea that Revelation 19 and 20 
are in chronological sequence, that would indicate that the kingdom is still future and that it will not be established until after the second coming. However, many people don't agree with what I just said. Premillennialists would agree with what I said, but amillennialists and postmillennialists would not. So let's review where the kingdom fits in the three millennial views. Now, everyone who takes eschatology seriously is trying to understand and explain how God will fulfill the promises that he made in the Bible regarding the kingdom that he said would be established after Israel's Old Testament kingdom folded in 586 BC. And this is really one of the fundamental goals of eschatology to understand this. Now, amillennialists, as we saw last time, believe that the kingdom of which Jesus spoke is an inner kingdom that exists now in which Jesus rules in the hearts of Christians. It has no external aspect. Postmillennialists, on, on the other hand, understand that the kingdom is an external kingdom now in the sense that Jesus is ruling over the earth through his agents, that is, Christians. Postmillennialists expect Christians to take increasing control over human society, and as they do, Christ will be ruling through them in abstentia. Now, premillennialists, again, have a different view. Premillennialists believe that the kingdom is external, but it's entirely future. Premillennialists believe that Christ will personally rule on earth. He will be present here over all mankind as king. He will be king over the nation of Israel and emperor over all kingdoms. And that's why he is called in the book of Revelation, king of kings and lord of lords. That's what an emperor is. An emperor is a king who rules over other kingdoms. Now, as we go through this course, you are going to see that we're going to spend more time talking about premillennialism. And I want to explain why we do that. It's not because the amill views and postmill views are not important. That's not true at all. Now here's a picture of the amill view and postmill views as we've seen them already. I want to show you two books. One of them is Burkhoff's Systematic Theology, and another one is a book written by Dwight Pentecost, my mentor who is now with the Lord, called Things to Come. Now, The Systematic Theology by Louis Burkhoff is a very well-respected book. Uh, Things to Come is a very highly respected book as well. Now, Burkhoff's Systematic Theology is a complete systematic theology dealing with all topics of theology. It's 784 pages long, and only 25 pages of that entire book are devoted to eschatology. Things to Come, on the other hand, is a book that deals only with eschatology, and all 683 pages of it deal with eschatology. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that the reason we won't be spending a lot of time on amill and postmill eschatology in detail is that the amill and postmill views of eschatology are extremely simple. The rapture, the second coming, and the great white throne judgment according to these two views, all happen at the same time, and then we move on into the eternal state. I don't want you uh, to feel that I'm shortchanging those views. I simply want to deal with the details that we see are necessary to understand the pre-mill view, and many of the details that we're going to discuss regarding, such, uh, regarding things such as the nature of the rapture, um, the nature of the great white throne judgment, what the second coming is going to be like. Many of those things overlap in all three views. So as we discuss them, many of the things are going to apply to all three views. Well, the next thing that I want to do is spend some time talking about principles for interpreting prophecy, and by the way, all, also the rest of scripture. Now, we had a question from one of our viewers last week, and it was a very good question. The question was this. If we're all reading the same Bible, why do we have different views on eschatology? And the answer has uh, partly to do with how we interpret the Bible. Not everybody interprets the Bible exactly the same way. In other words, not using exactly the same rules. And the other has to do with certain presuppositions. Now, I want to take you through a brief discussion 
of what is called literal interpretation. We're going to look, be looking at principles of literal interpretation that we will be using as we interpret prophecy. And I will also talk about why not everyone uses literal interpretation in the interpretation of prophecy. First of all, understanding prophecy is difficult. You are, as a student of the Bible, like a private eye. You're like a detective. And as you read through the Bible, you see things like this. Genesis 3.15 says that the seed of the woman will be victorious over Satan. Isaiah 53 says the Messiah will suffer for the sins of the wicked. Psalm 2 speaks of God's Son ruling over the kings of the earth. Daniel 9.26 that we'll look at later speaks of Messiah being cut off but not for himself. Daniel chapter 7, which we'll also look at later tonight, speaks of one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Then to him was given glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Now, all of these scriptures refer to the Messiah. They all refer to the person we call Jesus Christ. And putting them together and figuring out how, how these all fit into a cohesive picture is difficult. It's interesting. Peter spoke of this in chapter 1 of his book when he said, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Now what Peter is saying is this, even the people who wrote Scripture didn't always understand everything that they wrote. And if they didn't understand at all, we shouldn't be surprised that it's difficult to collect all the information and to put it together in a way that fits. So I just want to say that it takes time, careful observation of Scripture, and much thought and prayer to gain a sound understanding of prophecy. Well, the next thing I want to do is show you three principles of literal interpretation that have special application to prophecy. The first one is called prophetic foreshortening. Prophetic foreshortening is a term that describes how things may appear in a prophecy. God sometimes revealed in a prophecy several events to a prophet all at once, even though the events which are listed in a short part of scripture may actually be spread out by long periods of time. Now imagine that you're in a place that has mountains. Hong Kong has lots of mountains. If you go up on the peak and you look across the harbor, you see several ranges of mountains. Now, when you look at those mountains, they all appear to be at the same distance, but in reality, they're separated by large distances. Now, there's a sense in which prophetic shortening is a little bit like that. Listen to a passage that I'm sure is familiar to many of you. For unto us a child is born, and a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. Now, this is from Isaiah chapter 9. We often read this passage at Christmas. And interestingly, people understand this passage in different ways. Some people understand this passage as saying that the kingdom arrived with Jesus and the church is the kingdom. Others like me understand this passage as actually being spread out over a long period of time. Let me show that to you. For unto us a child is born and the son is given. Well, that refers to the first coming. The second se section, I believe, looks forward to the second coming of Christ and the millennium, the fulfillment of the promises that God made to King David. And the last statement from that time forward even forever looks forward to the continuation of the reign of Christ in the eternal state. I believe that this is an example of prophetic foreshortening. Now the next principle that I want to look at is called the progress of revelation. The progress of revelation is a term that describes how the picture of God's plan that was revealed in the Bible became clearer and more complete as the Bible grew to completion. 
Now, I think that you probably know that there are 66 books in the Bible and they were not all written at the same time. The earliest ones go back at least to around 1406 BC. And the latest book, the book of Revelation, was probably written around AD 96. Now, let's just imagine that you lived during that entire period when the Bible was growing to completion. And you read each book as it is published. Well, at the beginning, when you read, you have lots of questions and a little bit of understanding. And as you read more and you read more, the questions that you have become smaller because more information has been given and you're able to put the picture together more clearly. And your understanding grows. So once we have a complete Bible, at least potentially, we have a lot of information which we can put together if we're careful and we assemble it in a sensible way. Now because God revealed information in this step-by-step -step way, several things are true. First of all, earlier revelation, earlier books, uh, form the foundation for later revelation. Secondly, later revelation adds detail and clarifies earlier revelation. When we read in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of woman will strike the head of Satan, that's pretty vague. But when we get to the Gospels and we find out that Mary uh, produced Jesus by a virgin birth, then we see that Jesus is the seed of woman, but not the seed of man. Later revelation never contradicts earlier revelation. And to get a proper understanding, we need to consult all of Scripture. By the way, this is the reason why it would always be a terrible mistake to try to understand eschatology by beginning with the book of Revelation. We need the benefit of the foundation that is laid in the earlier parts of Scripture. The last principle of interpretation that I want to share with you is known as the analogy of Scripture. The analogy of Scripture is a term that refers to the fact that because all of Scripture comes from the mind of God, and because God doesn't contradict himself, it expresses a consistent and coherent body of truth. There's a sense in which the teachings of Scripture are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. If we are patient and diligent as we try to put those pieces together, we will see how they fit to give a clear, meaningful, and logically consistent picture. Now, we don't want to be like this guy. We don't want to come at Scripture with a hammer and try to force things to fit where they don't fit. The pieces will fit naturally and easily if we take the time to understand them rather than trying to modify them or force them together. Now, because of the analogy of Scripture, various passages are complementary rather than contradictory. God never contradicts himself. We can gather information from one topic I'm sorry, information on one topic from many passages. That's really what we do when we do systematic theology. And if we think that two scripture passages contradict each other, that tells us that what's wrong is our interpretation because scripture is never wrong. Now, personally, I believe that these principles of interpretation should be applied to all of the Bible, including prophecy. However, that's not always what Christian scholars and Bible students do, and I want to explain a little bit why that is the case. It has to do with presuppositions. Now, your presuppositions are going to affect how you interpret the Bible, not just in eschatology, but in other areas as well. But our concern is with eschatology. One presupposition of amillennial and postmillennial theologians is what they call the unity of the people of God. Now, they understand Israel to be God's people and they understand Christians in the church to be God's people. And so, taking this as a presupposition, in places of the Bible that seem to indicate that Israel and the church are not the same thing, they will typically abandon literal interpretation. They will say that this is not meant to be interpreted literally. Now, the presupposition that pre-mill theologians use when they approach scripture, particularly with regard to eschatology, but in reality with regard to all of theology, is that God has spoken clearly and unambiguously in the Bible. 
Therefore, consistent literal interpretation of all of scripture is the only valid method to use when we are studying any subject. And this leads to the conclusion that God has different programs for Israel and the church. Now, let me just point out reasons why, as a premillennialist, I don't see that Israel and the church can be the same group. Israel is a national group that's determined by descent. There are many people today who are Israelites, who are Jews, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are not believers and who will die and will go to hell. But the church consists only of saved people, and the church is not determined by descent. You can be a part of the body of Christ no matter who your ancestors are. So I think just that one observation makes it clear that the idea that Israel and the church are the same group just doesn't work. But having said that, I want to point out two things. All three views of eschatology are held by godly believers. I don't agree, for example, with Louis Burkhoff, who is an amillennialist on his eschatology, but I agree with almost all of his theology. And all three views are held by orthodox theologians. The differences in eschatology that people hold are significant, but they don't affect the gospel. Let's keep in mind that the gospel is the most important thing, and the gospel is the clearest thing in the Bible. Thank the Lord. Well, let's move on now to a brief look at the book of Daniel, and this is what we're going to spend the rest of our time on tonight. I want to start by talking about Daniel's times. Now, Daniel was deported to Babylon in the year 605. There were three deportations of the Israelites. The first was in 605, the second was in 597, and the last was in 586 when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Well, as Daniel writes, Jerusalem has fallen to Babylon. And a number of things are true. Israel and Judah, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, have both been expelled from the promised land according to the warnings and, in fact, the predictions that God had given in what we call either the Palestinian or the Mosaic or the land covenant. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 28 to 30. Those predictions were made, oh, wow, 900 years before the fall of Judah. With the fall of the kingdom, the Davidic dynasty is no longer reigning over Israel's people or their land. The kingdom of Israel has ceased to exist, just as God predicted in Deuteronomy 30, even before the kingdom came into existence. And of course, the prophets had been warning of this coming event for many, many years. When Daniel writes, the temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed. There are no sacrifices being offered. And at this point in history, if you were living in the times of Daniel, you might have concluded that Israel's God had been defeated by the gods of the Gentiles or that he had sim simply given up on the nation of Israel, that he was so frustrated with them that he was through with them. However, as you read through the book of Daniel, you discover that the book demonstrates uh, regarding God through his interactions with pagan kings, his protection of his servants, and the prophecies made in the book that number one, he is in control of all of the nations. Number two, all things are proceeding according to his plan. And number three, he fully intends to fulfill all of his covenant promises to Israel, including the reestablishment of the Davidic kingdom. Now, the reason I say this, of course, is because I hold to literal interpretation of prophecy. Now, I would love to take you through Daniel chapter 2. Our time is very brief tonight, and so I'm not going to do it. Let me simply summarize it very quickly. We're going to put our focus on Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. None of his wise men can interpret it, but Daniel tells the king that he is able to interpret it, and he does interpret it. His interpretation basically reveals the following points. First of all, a sequence of four Gentile empires, beginning with Babylon, which existed at the time when Daniel 
received this revelation, will dominate Israel until the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. Secondly, the empires will decline in value, but they will increase in strength and power. It's very interesting that the sequence is gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Gold is a very weak metal. Silver is somewhat stronger. Bronze is a lot stronger. And iron is much, much stronger. But in terms of value, you're going downhill. Now, the final empire is described as having a latter time involving ten toes and clay and iron. And that seems to be a picture of an empire that's held together by a federation of kingdoms but it's not very strong. Now the last thing that's revealed is that the final empire will be violently destroyed and displaced by what is called in the vision a stone cut out without hands. And that stone cut out without hands will become the worldwide eternal kingdom of God. Now when I read that every time it reminds me of the phrase the stone which the builders rejected which appears in Psalm 118, and also appears repeatedly in the New Testament. I think the stone cut out without hands is actually a reference to Jesus Christ himself. By the way, um, essentially all scholars understand Daniel chapter 2 in the same way. It's a prediction of four Gentile empires which will be followed by the kingdom of God on earth. Now we will identify those four empires a little bit later tonight. Now, if you have your Bible, you might want to turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 opens in 553 BC. Belshazzar is reigning, and Daniel has a dream in which he sees four creatures. The first one is a winged lion. The second one is a lopsided bear. The third is a leopard with four wings. And the fourth is a dreadful beast that has ten horns and a little red horn. And Daniel doesn't describe it as being like any particular animal. I'm going to skip quickly over the descriptions of the first three and focus on the fourth one. Reading in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words." So we've got the four beasts. Now, let me continue reading in verse 9. Daniel says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Now this is a scene from the throne room of heaven. There is about to be a judgment. Verse 11, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast, this is the fourth beast, was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Now I believe that that is a reference to the Antichrist uh, being cast into the lake of fire, which we see at the end of Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to skip over verse 12. If you want me to talk about verse 12, you can ask me about that during the question and answer time. Let's jump down to verse 13. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and here, of course, the Ancient of Days is a reference to God the Father, And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given kingdom and, I'm sorry, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, when I read verses 13 and 14, my thoughts immediately go to the promise that God made to King David when he said that a descendant of yours will one day begin to reign on the throne of Israel, and once he begins to reign, the kingdom of Israel will continue forever. I see this as a very clear reference to the establishment of what we call the Davidic kingdom. Now the question still remains, did Jesus establish that kingdom when he created the church at his first coming, or will he establish that kingdom when he returns to the earth at the second coming, before the millennium? Amillennialists would take the first choice, premillennialists would take the second choice. Now, let me keep reading. Verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Now in this context, the saints of the kingdom is a reference to Jewish believers. Verse 19, Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. And then Daniel gives a description of the fourth beast in verses 19 and 20. I'm going to skip over that because of time, because he basically repeats himself. Verse 21, I was watching, and the same horn was making war with the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Please notice that the angel tells Daniel that just before the kingdom is established, there's going to be a time of great persecution of believers. Now the angel continues in verse 25, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. By the way, that fits the description of the fourth empire in chapter 2 very well. Verse 24, The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and intend to change times and law. That's probably a reference to the efforts of the Antichrist to derail God's end time program. Now continuing in verse 25, Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. We'll come back to that number in a few moments. Verse 26, but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. In other words, the little horn will lose his position of reign. Verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Let's see if we can put the, picture, the pieces of this picture together. We see once again in Daniel chapter 7, just as in Daniel chapter 2, that four Gentile empires here represented as beasts will come in sequence. Now the focus here is on the last empire and the beast, which is being described as dreadful, strong, and having iron teeth, and in particular on its last ruler, the little horn who arises from among ten horns, and displaces three other rulers. I think this is a description of how he comes to a position of supreme power as he builds his worldwide empire. Now this final ruler is human. He's pompous, meaning extremely proud, and he's blasphemous. That fits the picture that we see of the Antichrist in the New Testament. He will persecute the saints for a period of three and a half times and will be victorious over them. Now, why do I say three and a half times? Well, we're told time, then times, time is one, times is two or more, and half a time. Now, if we take the simplest possibility, we have one 
plus two, and then a half. That adds up to three and a half. Now we will see when we get to Daniel chapter seven that that is confirmed by the numbers in Daniel chapter seven. And when we finally get to the book of Revelation, we will see that it's also confirmed there. The book of Revelation speaks of a period of 1,260 days or 42 months, and that adds up to three and a half years, where each year is 360 days long. Now, this ruler will persecute the saints for a period of three and a half times. He will be victorious over them in the sense that he will succeed in killing them, but of course not in ending their eternal salvation. The saints will be declared victors by God. Some of them will survive until the end of this period. One like the Son of Man will come with the clouds of heaven, as we saw in verse 13, and he will be enthroned by God the Father over all the earth in a never-ending reign and a universal kingdom, an empire, if you will. And the saints will rule and reign with the Son of Man. Now, this is basically a discussion of the very last years just before the second coming because the arrival of the Son of Man with the clouds of heaven is what we call the second coming as it's described in the New Testament. Let me show this to you on a timeline. Now on this timeline I show you the lion, the bear, the leopard, and I put in the dates of the transitions between the various empires. You'll see in a few minutes that this is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Rome is the time of the dreadful beast. Now sometime within the reign of the fourth empire, the dreadful beast, the little horn will begin to reign. He will at one point during his reign begin to fight against the saints. That period will last for three and a half times. Again, I'm avoiding adding numbers here for now. At the end of that period of time, the little horn will be condemned, the saints will be declared victors, the Son of Man will arrive, we call him the Messiah, he will receive the eternal kingdom, he will begin to rule on the earth, and he and the Jewish saints will begin to enjoy the kingdom which was predicted in the prophecies uh, given to King David and in many other places in the Old Testament. Now, I'm going to put a little more information on the screen right now. We won't talk about it much. Jesus called the period of time leading up to the second coming, the times of the Gentiles in Luke chapter 21. In Daniel 2.44, the period of the reign of Messiah is called the kingdom of the God of heaven. And I've given you a list not only of places in the book of Daniel, but a couple of places in the New Testament where we see the second coming of Christ being described in the same words that we see here, the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven. Well, we need to move on because our time is passing quickly. In this slide, I'm showing you the information that we gather from chapter 2, from chapter 7, and from chapter 8. Now, we don't have time to look at chapter 8 tonight. But chapter 2 revealed that the first of the four empires is Babylon. Chapter 8 reveals that the second one is Medo-Persia and that the third is Greece. Now, no chapter in the book of Daniel identifies the fourth chapter by name, but we know from history that Rome is the empire that took over the territory that was controlled by Greece. And so the sequence of four empires is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, let me just say briefly in favor of the Amil and Postmill views that they hold that the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom which Christ predicted, follows the fourth empire, and the fourth empire is Rome. And Rome went out of business around 400 AD. So there's a little bit of evidence here to suggest that in some sense the church really is the kingdom. However, I don't think that that's the way it works. And as we go through the course, I think you'll see why. I want to go now to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 begins with a prayer. Daniel notes in his prayer that Israel is nearing the completion of the period of 70 years of judgment that God had predicted. He confesses his sin and that of the people of Israel. 
He declares that God has been faithful in fulfilling and carrying out what he warned would take place if Israel was unfaithful to him. He notes that because of the fall of Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem and the lack of a functioning temple, that God's name is being reproached. Daniel asks for mercy, and he says, God, have mercy upon your people Israel and your city Jerusalem. He appeals to God's name and his reputation. His prayer is a wonderful example of a wise intercessory prayer. I wish we had time to look at it tonight. But I want to go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Let me read that verse to you. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Let me put those six things on the screen. It's a very interesting study to go through these and try to figure out exactly what they are, but I think all of them essentially deal with Israel reaching the end of the time of her prophesied judgment and finally coming to the point where she recognizes that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we call him, really is the one who was promised to them in the Old Testament. Now, number five, to seal up vision and prophecy, I think that means to reach the end of the predicted time of Israel not having a kingdom. And to anoint the most holy either refers to um, the cleansing of a future temple in Jerusalem, or it may refer to the anointing of Jesus as Messiah when he begins what I believe is his millennial reign. Well, the next thing I want to do, and we're going to spend the rest of our time tonight on this, is looking at the last three verses of Daniel chapter 9. These are very complex they're full of information and they're quite fascinating. So let's work through them. Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. All right, let's work through this verse by verse. Verse 25 again. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Now, one of these is an event and the other is a person. That's an interesting way of identifying an interval. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. There shall be seven sevens. It's literally seven sevens, not seven weeks, but seven sevens and 62 sevens. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. Well, people have tried to figure out what this is talking about. And it's pretty clear that the first event, the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, is the decree that we read about in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 2. We know that date exactly from secular history outside of the Bible. That was March 5th. 444 BC. Now, if we take the hypothesis that I suggested in Daniel chapter 7, that we're dealing with prophetic years, which are 360 days long, and we take 7 plus 62, and we add them together, we get 69. If we take 69 years of 360 days apiece, that adds up to 173,880 days. And if we count forward from the decree of Nehemiah chapter 2, we end up on the exact date of the triumphal entry, which was March 30th, 33 AD. 
Now that makes sense. We're told from the decree until Messiah the Prince, this period of time will pass. Well, the triumphal entry was the only day upon which Jesus allowed people to publicly proclaim him as Messiah and didn't tell them not to say it. I think it makes perfect sense that this is the interval that we're talking about. Now, come to verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, now remember the 62 weeks is the latter part of the 69 weeks. So this is not during the 69 weeks. This is after the 69 weeks have been completed. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. I think that's quite obviously a reference to the cross. That took place after the triumphal entry. And then we read, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, the city of Jerusalem is what this prophecy is about. The sanctuary is another word for the temple. We know that the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70 by Titus and his armies. Now, A.D. 70 is, what, 37 years after March 30th, 33 A.D. Now, that would seem to take us way past the end of the 70 years, but it doesn't. Let's see why. We come to verse 27. Then he, well, he is the prince who is to come, and that is the leader of the people who destroyed the city of Jerusalem, the Romans. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one seven, but in the middle of seven he shall bring the seven. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Well, let's look at that last week. It begins with some kind of a covenant, which is apparently made by a ruler who has some kind of an association with the Roman Empire. In the middle of the 70th seven, he is going to stop sacrifice and offering. That apparently means an end to sacrifices in some kind of a temple in Jerusalem. And then he's going to perform what is called the abomination of desolation. Jesus refers to this in Matthew 24. I believe this is a future event in which the Antichrist is going to walk into the temple that the Jews will rebuild in Jerusalem during the first half of the 70th seven. He will desecrate it. He will begin to demand worship for himself and forbid worship of the true God. Now, let's think about what's going on here. Um, the event that ends the 70th seven is the second coming of Christ that we looked at in Daniel chapter seven. It's when he comes with the clouds of heaven. That's why we see at the end of verse 27, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. That is a fancy way of saying, when this end time ruler who we call the Antichrist is judged and removed from power. So the sequence of 77s takes us from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem all the way to the second coming, but obviously a period of 490 years of 360 days ran out a long time ago. So how can this work? It can only work if there is a gap of unknown length in the middle of this time period. Now let's see how this looks. I've just filled in a little bit of data here. The first half of the 70th seven, Jesus called the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 28. We'll look at that later. He called the second half the Great Tribulation. Now, I want you to imagine this period of 77s as being built into a special stopwatch that God has. The stopwatch begins at Artaxerxes' degree, at decree. It runs for 69 sevens, and it stops at the triumphal entry. Now, we know it has to stop because the cross and the destruction of Jerusalem take place after the first 69s have taken place, but before the 70th seven begins. Now, 
that period in the middle of unknown length is where we live. We are somewhere in that period. The stopwatch will begin when this ruler who is associated with the Romans, who we call the Antichrist, makes a covenant with many and the stopwatch will run for seven more years and then Christ will return at the second coming. He will remove this end time ruler who we call the Antichrist. He's called the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 and then Christ will begin to reign. So the 70th seven of Daniel includes what Jesus called a time of tribulation and a time of unprecedented great tribulation. The abomination of desolation which falls in the middle of this is mentioned in Matthew chapter 24 and also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now let me push on because our time is tight. What I'm showing you on this visual and, and don't worry if you can't grab it all now. This is on the handout that I'm giving you that you'll get later tonight. I've shown you the timeline that we see in Daniel chapter 2, the timeline that comes from Daniel chapter 7 and 8, the timeline from Daniel chapter 9, and then at the bottom I put the pre-millennial timeline. Now you may be able to see that there's one event that appears on every one of these timelines. It's the violent overthrow of the last Gentile empire in Matthew 2. It's the event where Messiah receives the kingdom in Daniel chapter 7. It's the destruction of the end time ruler who desecrates the temple in Daniel chapter 9. And it's the event that we call the second coming using New Testament terminology in the pre-mill view. All right, let me summarize the key concepts that we have seen in this session. First of all, the kingdom, which is predicted in the Old Testament and spoken of in the Gospels, is viewed differently in each of the millennial views. Literal interpretation, if you use it consistently with all of the Bible, leads to premillennialism. The amill and postmill views require abandonment of literal interpretation in much of prophecy. Now, in fairness to those theologians, they use literal interpretation in most of the rest of Scripture. Daniel's prophecies that we've been looking at came after the Davidic kingdom ceased to exist, and yet Daniel's prophecies predict the reestablishment of a kingdom of Israel. Four Gentile empires will dominate Israel during the times of the Gentiles. The fourth empire will conclude with the reign of a little horn who will persecute Israel and he will appear to succeed until the time of the kingdom of the Son of Man comes. The period of persecution will last for three and a half times, then the Son of Man will begin his reign. A period of 77s is allotted for the completion of six key accomplishments for Israel and Jerusalem. Between the first 69 sevens and the beginning of the 70th seven, Messiah will be cut off, that's the cross, and Jerusalem will be destroyed, that's A.D. 70. In the midpoint of the 70th seven, the end time ruler will commit the abomination of desolation. History and scripture strongly confirm that each of the sevens of Daniel chapter 9 is a period of seven years of 360 days each. We'll talk about that more later. And the goal toward which prophecy looks in the book of Daniel is the reestablishment of of the Davidic kingdom of Israel under the reign of the Son of Man. This will fulfill the predictions of the prophets and the Davidic covenant. Now I'm just going to flash up on the screen your reading assignment. This will be distributed to you through Facebook. It's about time for our question and answer session. And so I'm going to turn it over to our moderator to uh, bring me questions. Thank you, Dr. D, uh, for uh, doing a very brief and fast yes. uh, overview of a lot of things. Uh, we have tons of questions. Uh, okay. Let me begin. Uh, if you have more questions, please uh, do uh, write it down in the uh, comment box. Uh, uh, I will be posting um, most of the questions, and Dr. D, you just uh, let us know if, if you're going to answer it or not, because some of the questions are not directly related to our uh, topic. Mm -hmm. 
the first question is for people living in the world pre-Christ, uh, like in China, where most of the people did not have any idea about God as we know him today, mm-hmm. uh, then are they hell bound? How can we explain this to friends and family whom we want to be saved, but they cannot reconcile that a supposedly loving and merciful God can allow so many people to perish when they did not even have the chance to hear the gospel? Sure. Um, I'll give you a brief answer only. I could talk about this for an hour. I think this is an important question. I appreciate the person who asked it. The first thing that we have to keep in mind as we approach this question is the reality of human sin. The reality of human sin is undeniable. And if God were just but not merciful, all of us would be condemned. That's a hard thing to accept, but it is what the Bible teaches, and I think it really is obvious. When we talk about grace, we need to recognize that God is not obligated to save anyone, and when God does save people, every single salvation is an act of grace. It's a gift that the person who is saved doesn't merit. Now, the Bible is very clear. There's only one way to be saved. That is by faith in God. Now, since the cross, the only object of faith which God accepts is belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Before the cross, people obviously couldn't believe in the death, resurrection, uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Before the cross, I believe what people were required to believe was what God had revealed up until that point. Now, we don't really know how far the knowledge of God, which is revealed in Scripture, went in ancient history. It's interesting, though, there seems to be evidence that the knowledge of Israel's God reached, for example, China um, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. No one can be saved without receiving God's gift of grace, and God gives that gift to those who believe what he proclaims. I think we need to face the fact that even in the world today, the majority of people are dying unsaved. That is a sad thing, but I think it's a fact. And all I can say is this, past history is beyond anything that we can do to influence, but the present we can influence by seeking to share the gospel, by seeking to live godly lives that will attract others to Christ. That's what we need to do. We need to trust in God's goodness. We also need to remember that justice is important and God is both good and just. We need to leave it up to him. Let's take the next question. The next question is, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm just throwing at it. I don't know where this is coming from. Why does God have to create a battlefield and spend thousands of years fighting Satan? Can't God just destroy Satan in the beginning when Satan rebels against, rebel against God? Okay, quick answer. Yes, he could have, but he chose not to. Um, now, I'm not being flippant. Um, why questions are always tricky. I personally believe that one of the things that God loves to do is to reveal himself to his creatures, to let his creatures know what he is like. And I believe that through the sequence of events involving God's battle with Satan and involving his redemption of mankind, God is revealing things about himself that we would never know if sin hadn't taken place. If sin had never taken place, we would not know about God's justice. If sin had never occurred, we would not know about God's mercy and forgiveness. We are God's creatures. He created us for his purpose. I think it's okay to ask why questions, but in the end, I think what we need to do is rejoice that God is both good and just and seek to find our place in his plan. Right. It's God. If God is omnipresent, does that mean he is also in hell? 
Simple answer is yes. Um, Psalm 139, verse 8. Let's see if I can find it. The psalmist says, oh, verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Now, God's omnipresence is a difficult concept. God fills everything. There is no place where God is not, certainly in the sense of his perfect knowledge of everything and his influence in every place. Um, but remember, God is not physical in the sense that we are or limited in, the, in location. So that to say that God is in hell is very different than to say that a person is in hell. All right. Uh, there are several questions uh, that is that is stringed together here. Uh, let me ask: uh, When, when in the timeline is the judgment seat of Christ? Okay, fantastic question. Second um, Corinthians, chapter five, uh, verse ten: For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The he, the Greek word here is the bima that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, most theologians, uh, well, first of all, if, if you hold to the amill or post-mill view, then your understanding is most likely that the bima, the judgment seat of Christ, will essentially coincide with the time of the great white judgment at the end of history. For premillennialists, I believe that the overwhelming majority of premillennialists believe that the Bema will take place after the rapture during the tribulation period. So we go up in the rapture before the tribulation begins. During the tribulation, we will stand before Christ to have our deeds judged. Now, the, the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers and it will never result in eternal condemnation. The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is essentially to reward us for those things which we did which are pleasing to God and to reveal those things which we did which have no everlasting uh, value. I believe that when we return with Christ at the second coming, we will begin to rule and reign with him during the millennium, at least in the pre-mill view if you hold that, and it's during the millennium that we will begin to enjoy the benefits of the rewards that we receive, that each one of us will receive as a result of standing before his judgment seat. What and when is the war of Armageddon? Okay. Um, the phrase Armageddon comes from Revelation chapter 16. It's often translated battle, but it would probably better be translated campaign. We'll talk about this a little bit when we get to the book of Revelation, but I believe that the campaign of Armageddon takes place in the very latter part of the seven-year tribulation. And it will begin with an attempted overthrow of the reign of Antichrist by some of the nations which he rules, and it will end when those who are battling Antichrist and Antichrist and his armies look up and they see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and they realize that Christ is about to descend to the earth and they will stop pointing their guns at each other and they will point their guns up and attempt to prevent Christ and the saints from coming down to earth, but they will fail. So a short answer is that the campaign of Armageddon begins near the end of the tribulation and it leads right up to the second coming of Christ. Okay. Uh, next question. Why should there be a rapture? Um, why should there be? Well, this is, this is a number one of, another one of the why questions. Um, one way to answer the question is simply that that's part of God's plan and he wants it that way. However, at least if you hold to the pre-mill, well, 
Let me explain the purpose of the rapture in the pre-mill view, in the post-mill view, and in the amill view. All right, and let's start with the amill and post-mill views. In the amill and post-mill views, in this great event at the end of history, which includes the rapture, the second coming, and the great white throne judgment, Christ comes down from heaven, bringing with him the spirits of all believers who died up to that point and have been waiting in heaven. Believers on earth go up, meet them, they are transformed, they get their resurrection bodies, and they come down to the earth with Christ. Right? In the amill and post-mill views, this is understood as essentially a welcoming committee. The Christians who are left on the earth go up to meet Christ and to escort him back down to the earth. It's a welcoming committee. Now, in the pre-mill view, unless you hold to a post-tribulation rapture, which takes place at the second coming, whether the rapture is at the beginning of the tribulation or the middle of the tribulation or sometime near the end of the tribulation but not at the end, the rapture is a removal of a final generation of Christians before the worst parts of the judgments of the tribulation take place. Now, pre-trib people believe that Christians will not go through any of the tribulation. Mid-tribbers believe they won't go through the last half. And pre-wrath people believe they won't go through the bowl judgments. But in each case, it is, in a sense, a rescue from experiencing God's wrath. Now, one of the reasons that people hold that view is 1 Thessalonians 5.9, where Paul says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one way to understand that verse is simply to say that because Jesus Christ died on the cross, we don't have to go to hell. But in context, Paul is talking about the events of eschatology. So many people, and I agree with them, say that this has to do with Christians who remain on the earth as the, the second coming of Christ approaches being prevented from experiencing the wrath of God. Now, pre-tribbers would call the entire tribulation time of wrath. Mid-tribbers would call the second half the time of wrath. And again, pre-wrath people would call the bowl judgments the time of wrath. Now, there's a little bit more here, okay? Um, let me not forget, if you're pre-mill, but you hold to a post-trib uh, post rapture, then you, like a-mill and post-mill people, believe that the rapture is simply an escorting of Christ down to the earth. But if you are a premillennialist who holds to the pre-trib view, there's another reason for the rapture, and that is the removal of the bride of Christ, which is different than the nation of Israel, so that God can finish his unfinished business with the nation of Israel, and that unfinished business is the six things that we read about in Daniel chapter 9, um, where we're told that by the end of the 70th sevens, God will have accomplished all those things. He will conclude the accomplishment of those things during the 70th seven. Um, I'll also refer you to Romans chapter 11. By the way, last week I said Romans chapter 12. I misspoke. Um, verse 25, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that hardening in, in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, I believe that's when the rapture takes place and then God turns his focus to the nation of Israel once again to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies and to carry out the things that are predicted for the 70th seven. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, the next question we have is, I don't know if you can answer this, but I probably can answer it biblically. What is it like in the lake of fire? Hmm. I... I can't tell you any more about it than what the name tells you. Um, I will point out a couple of things, however. Hell, or Hades, is not the same as the lake of fire. I think I said this last week, it's a waiting place. 
Um, those who go to the lake of fire will receive resurrection bodies before they are sent to the lake of fire. Now, the vast majority of Orthodox Christians believe that the suffering of the lake of fire is eternal. Whether that is excruciating agony or not, I cannot answer that question. But I can say this, on the basis of the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, I think it's quite obvious that hell, the waiting place, is a time of discomfort, but it is not a place of excruciating agony. Beyond that, I can't really tell you much more than the, about the lake of fire, except that I'm very happy that I'm not going there. All right. Uh, there are several questions. I, I'm just going to uh, summarize it. Uh, is, the, uh, is our current world events uh, recorded or uh, related to the, uh, the rapture? And is, it, is the rapture more nearer because of what's happening? And how should we Christian live? Okay. All right. Um, I think we have two questions there. Let's talk about current events first. If you hold to an imminent rapture, meaning a rapture which is not predictable, then trying to judge the nearness of the rapture by looking at events in the world is never going to work. Um, I believe that the New Testament writers do indicate that the rapture is unpredictable, but I think it's not a strong argument. Now, we will be looking at Matthew 24 in a later session. Let me read a few verses out of Matthew 24 just to address this question briefly. In verse 4, Jesus says, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, among premillennial uh, theologians, there is a bit of a split regarding how we should understand what Jesus just said. Many prophecy teachers look at this passage and they say that this is a prediction of the world going downhill and of natural disasters that are going to take place before the rapture comes. Now, if that is the case, that would seem to undermine the teaching of the rest of the New Testament, which suggests that the rapture is unpredictable. There are others, like myself, who believe that the things that we just read about are a description of the first four seal judgments of the book of Revelation, which we know take place during the seven-year tribulation. If that is correct, then and if the rapture takes place before the tribulation begins, then none of those things will precede the rapture. Now, even if the first view is correct, that these things precede the rapture, it doesn't really help us much because Jesus says there are going to be a lot of these things. Well, then the question is, how much is a lot? And the answer is, a lot is a lot, but there can also be more. So I don't think that we can intelligently look at events that are happening in the world, like viruses, that's a plague, earthquakes, floods, wars, etc. I don't think we can use them to judge the nearness of the rapture. And I don't think that we need to estimate the time of the rapture. And that, that goes to the second part of the question, and, and I appreciate the way this person asked the question. How then should we live? The answer is, we should live every day as if it could be our last. Um, we don't want to be in the silly position of being lazy and then finding out, oh no, the rapture is 10 days from now. I better get my act together and earn some treasure in heaven. That's not the way God wants us to live. And I won't read it to you now, but I will refer you back to the text that we read last week, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. That's exactly what it says. It says, 
for those of us who have been saved, knowing that Christ is going to return should motivate us to live godly lives every day. By the way, in that passage, when Paul talks about the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, my personal opinion is that the blessed hope refers to the rapture and the glorious appearing refers to the second coming. But no matter how you look at it, whether you're on-mill, post-mill, pre-mill, wherever you put the rapture, the only way to be prepared for the rapture, really, is to seek to make every day a good and godly day. Next question. Thank you, sir. Uh, should we take uh, the number 666 as it is, the, um, the microchip or markings? Uh, Let's... Because R.C. Sproul mentioned that 666 is a number that symbolizes the imperfection while the seventh day is the completion of God's creation, mm. seven, number seven. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. I don't think that those of us who live now and who will not be in the events of the tribulation will be able to figure out what 666 refers to exactly. Now, I do agree to some extent that 666 in its symbolism does refer to the fact that the satanic trinity of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet falls short of perfection. Now, I don't know anywhere that the number 777 appears in the Bible, but the number 7 is very important in the book of Revelation, and it seems to be a number that refers to perfection. So I think there's definitely some symbolism in the number, but I also think that it refers to something very concrete and I think only the people who are living during the second half of the tribulation who are on earth at that time will be able to figure out exactly what it is. Okay, uh, there's a question here. Uh, Craig Keener takes the mark of the beast as referring to the Jewish practice of gematria. He has suggested that the mark of the beast refers immediately to Nero, given a textual variant of 616 instead of 666. Uh, what? Uh, would you have any comments on this? Sure. Um, yeah, Gamatria is is a game that you play with numbers where you assign uh, numbers to letters and you add them up. Um, well, the first thing that I would say is that the the argument that the events of the book of Revelation are talking about things that happened during the first century is extremely weak. When we get to the book of Revelation, I will show you the time structure of the book and it's very clear that starting in chapter 4, John is giving a prophecy of events that were future in his day. Furthermore, the strong evidence of history is that John wrote this book in the 90s, long after the emperors, which many people try to identify with the book, um, were gone. Um, the other thing that I would point out is that Gematria is a very slippery game. People have shown that the name of Napoleon, the name of Hitler, the name of Barack Obama, George Bush, um, Emmanuel Macron, I mean, you can do these names in a lot of different ways and figure out ways to make them add up to 666. Um, as I said in answering the previous question, my personal opinion is that it will only be people who are on the earth during the future tribulation, which I think uh, this is referring to, who will be able to figure out what 666 refers to. Um, and, you know, if, if so much of the book of Revelation is about things that took place in the first century, and yet we're warned that they're coming, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So the view that you're talking about when you ask this question is called preterism. Preterism is the idea that most of the events of the book of Revelation took place during the first century and that the book of Revelation was essentially a piece of Christian propaganda in which they didn't use real names because they were afraid that the Roman emperors would figure out who they were talking about. I think that that's an extremely weak argument and as far as I'm concerned, it's wrong. Uh, we have limited time. Uh, let's allow two more questions. Uh, 
for our question and answer before we end our second session. Um, this is the first question. This is two questions together that is related. If, if people die, where do their spirit go? Can people in hell still be saved? Okay. First answer, when an unsaved person dies, his spirit goes to hell. When a saved person dies, his spirit goes to the third heaven, to the presence of Christ. Second question, can a person who dies unsaved be saved? The answer is no. Hebrews 9.27, it is given unto man once to die, and after this comes the judgment. Um, there's no salvation after physical death. Now, Terrence, be before we take the next question, I want to say something um, very quickly. Last week, after our class was over, I listened to the video and I realized to my horror that twice I said Christ when I meant Satan. I'm sure that some of our viewers noticed that. I have corrected that in the video that will eventually be available to you, but I just want to apologize to all of you and to the Lord for having made that mistake. Um, some of my students know that occasionally I say the opposite of what I mean. And um, anyway, sorry about that. Okay, one more question. Notes are noted. Noted. Uh, there are several. There are more questions, but we cannot take more. Uh, this is the last question. What is the biblical warrant for the gap uh, theory, gap or unknown land uh, between the uh, the cross and the tribulation, the sixty nine and the seventh week? Was oh. the stopwatch not revealed to Daniel at chapter seven? Is is because the church is part of the mystery that was revealed only at the Pentecost? Okay. Um, yeah, Daniel chapter 7 doesn't talk about the gap within the time of the Fourth Empire. Only Daniel chapter 9 speaks of it. Um, I would say that there's plenty of evidence in the Old Testament that Messiah would have two different kinds of ministries. One would be a time when he would suffer for sin and the other would be a time when he would reign. Um, that gave a clue to Jewish scholars even before the time of Christ. They tried to solve it by saying that there were two different messiahs. Um, I think that the prophecy of Daniel is extremely clear, especially when we have the benefit of being able to look back on the fulfillment of the first 69 weeks. Um, I'm not sure what else to say at this point. I think it'll become clearer as we continue on through the course. Okay, uh, we have a minute left. Maybe I can fit in one more question. Okay. Um, can you comment on the phrase Israel of God used yes. by the Apostle Paul? Not all Israel are descended, descendants from Israel. Not, yeah. not yeah. all who are descendants are Abraham's children. Romans 9, 6 to 7. Right, okay. Um, well, there's two things, first of all. Um, the Bible doesn't, the Bible never says that Christians are children of Jacob. The Bible says that Christians are children of Abraham. Now, what I'm going to say is going to shock some of you, but if you think about it, you'll realize that it's true. Abraham was not an Israelite. The first Israelite was his grandson, Jacob, whom God named Israel. When the New Testament says that Christians are sons of Abraham, it's not saying that we are spiritual Israelites, it's saying that we are like Abraham in that we have the same faith that he has. Now, at the end of the book of Galatians, Paul says this in verse 16, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, if you study the book of Galatians carefully, you will realize that when Paul says the Israel of God, he's not referring to the church. He's referring to Israelites who are believers in Jesus Christ. And so that terminology, the Israel of God, does not mean that the church is Israel. And the terminology that says Christians are children of Abraham doesn't mean that Christians are spiritual Jews. Because Abraham wasn't a Jew. He wasn't an Israelite. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our second session. The end time is closer every day. Uh, we know we have more questions to ask, but our time is up. 
uh, don't worry, we have recorded your questions and we will try to ask those questions uh, when the time comes. Uh, we look forward to our next session, our third session, uh, next Saturday, 7.30. Uh, good night, everybody. Have a blessed day tomorrow. Have a blessed Lord's Day tomorrow.